cool. All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Brave Sound Podcast. Today, we have a super special guest. I'm really excited to be able to get to talk to and have a conversation with Mr. Jaleel Shaw today. So thank you so much, Jaleel Shaw, for coming on. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. So uh, before we go further, I want to just back up a moment and talk about what this show is about. This show is where we uncover the stories, processes, and worldviews behind some of New York City's most creative and artful musicians. Uh, I want to have my friend Austin. I think he'll be the most appropriate to introduce Mr. Jaleel Shaw to the to the podcast because uh, they have been studying together for I think I believe three years now, right? At Manhattan School of Music. Yeah, Jaleel's. We've been three years. Yeah, my freshman second semester freshman year freshman year of college, Jaleel came to MSM, and yeah, it's been an amazing ride. I've learned so much from this uh, this man. Like, really, it's it's been the closest thing. Well, I guess in the jazz tradition, there's a big tradition of mentorship. And, you know, it, I think it's every young, like, musician's dream to find somebody who, like, really will be that figure for them and, like, really care about them and really give them all these things. And Jaleel has definitely uh, filled that role for me. And I think that's getting, that mentorship model is getting rarer and rarer, you know. Mm. Um so yeah, a, a very influential figure in my life, but you may know him from his own records. He has three records of his own out. Um, he has been in the Roy Haynes Fountain of Youth Band for over a decade. Uh, he, he played with Tom Harrell, C- Colors of a Dream, uh, Nate Smith, Kinfolk, and many, many other projects. He's now a professor at Manhattan School of Music. Are you teaching anywhere else, Jalil? At the new uh, school? I teach at new school, yeah. Just yeah. Uh, private lessons, yeah. Yeah, so... Yeah, please please welcome to Brave Sound Podcast, Jaleel Shaw. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> and so I was, Mike and I were doing some thinking about uh, what are some things that you you can specifically speak to that really almost nobody else can, you know. And what came to mind was just all these incredible. I mean, you're a great leader, and you've had uh, three phenomenal records, but your sideman career is I think something anybody can be envious of. Roy Haynes and Tom Harrell and uh, Dave Holland and and Nate Smith now too, just so many different things. Um, And like who else can speak to all these different experiences, you know? Mm. So maybe I'll start off with what are some things that you think have you've done that have helped you be put in that position? Uh, to be in a lot of diverse situations and a lot of like high level situations uh, and that can be musically it can be personally or what what, what have you uh, that's a good question <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe prayed <laughs> uh, you know I <laughs> I think really it's it's uh you know, I think it's a combination of things. Um, I did practice, you know, I practiced a lot and I, I definitely, um, you know, especially, I mean, I, I, I think I'm, 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 I'm blessed to have been in, you know, kind of like immersed in this music from a very young age, Yeah. you know, um, And my mom had me in all different kinds of uh, situations from from the time I was uh, four years old until, you know, college, you know, um, all kinds of classes, violin, piano, drums, um, clarinet, flute, you know, she would take me to all these, Mm. all these lessons, you know, and she took me to ensemble lessons. I mean, she had me in sports, she had me in drawing classes. So I think that that's one thing that kind of like set me up well, was just having a a, a, a parent that was so supportive yeah, all of my life, you know? And um, I think there was something, you know, there was kind of a humility that came with it that kind of like, you know, I don't know, I, I, I saw my mom doing this by herself and, you know, I was just so thankful and I, I just really wanted to try to work as hard as I could 
so that I can do something for her, <laughs> Yeah, you know, when that. the time came. But also, I think that I just I was I was really supported by the Philadelphia jazz scene, too. I was really, really like, you know, embraced. Um, I couldn't go to anyone's gig in Philly without my horn when I was a kid. So I had that support and, you know, um, I had that support all the way through, you know, when I finished that Manhattan School of Music from from my friends that and, and family, uh, musical family in Philadelphia. And, um, you know, uh, once I got out um, and, and, and I think one thing that I, I can say for sure is that a lot of opportunities are based on, you know, I mean, it's like word of mouth, you know, um, the first gig I got from when I moved to New York was actually uh, the Mingus Big Band. Mm. And I got that big, I got that gig because I happened to be going down to the Mingus Big Band every Thursday because I was still in, in um, at Manhattan School of Music and Jonathan Blake was in the band. Mm. And I was so, you know, I, 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 I would have class until late and Jonathan would be my ride home. I wouldn't have to take the bus because I lived in New Jersey. So I would just stop by the Mingus Big Band and, and get a ride home with Jonathan. And eventually they were seeing me there all the time and I got the gig. Mm. Um, and then the next call I got was from the Count Basie Orchestra. Um, and I'm, you know, I was still at Manhattan School of Music at the time, but the Count Basie Orchestra, no one had ever heard me, but someone had heard about me and they called me to do the gig. And I, you know, I joined and I started playing um, with them. Um, then from Dave Holland, Dave Holland, um, Robin Eubanks told Dave Holland about me. You know, how did you meet Dave Robin? Holland called me, huh? How, when did you meet Robin in Philly or in school? I met Robin through the Mingus Big Band. Oh wow! One after yeah, another. Yeah, Robin huh? heard me through. So, so we, we didn't know each other from Philly. I, I actually knew his brother, and I had played a lot with his brother Dwayne Kev. Eubanks. Oh. Yeah, Dwayne's a the, Dwayne's a younger twin. That there's there's two young twins. There's Kevin too. Eubanks too, as well, right? Yeah, Kevin plays guitar. Okay. Yeah, I met Kevin way, way, way later. Wow, I didn't know there was three of them. I thought it was. It's just... four. It's oh, four, four of them. Of them. Yeah. Wow. Yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> very cool. Yeah, they have a very musical family, and their their mother's a great organist too. But yeah, so that's you know I started I I did some stuff with Dave, through through Robin, and same thing with you know with Roy Haynes. Um, I uh, uh, I think Walter Smith, Walter Smith was subbing in Roy Haynes' band at the time, and Roy Haynes needed, um, well, well, they, they had called Walter to do a tour and Walter couldn't do it. I think he was doing a Monk program at the time. And he called me and he said, hey man, um, do you think you wanna, you wanna um, do these gigs with, with Roy? It's a tour of Europe. And um, it was, like a, it, it was like a whole fall and winter of gigs. Yeah. He said, do you want to do these gigs? And I said, sure. I said, of course. <laughs> yeah. You know, and um, the band members at the time were Martin Bejarano and um, uh, Martin Bejarano and John Sullivan hmm. um, on bass. And they both knew who I was. And um, when the management called, so Roy, Roy didn't really have that much to do with it at the time. The management called them and said, hey, can you vouch for this guy? Walter is recommending this guy um, to do the tours. Mm -hmm. And they said, yeah, you know, we played with them. So they gave me all these dates. We had a tour of Europe. We had a, a gig in um, Battleboro, Vermont. That was my first gig. And then, and we had a, a week at the Iridium. And I'll, I'll never forget because I had all these gigs and I had never really played with Roy before, you know, <laughs> except for at a, at a, at a jam session. We did a jam. I, 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 no, it wasn't a jam session. I won this Boston Jazz Society Award when I was in college. And the, the guy that ran the Boston Jazz Society was Roy Haynes' brother. So Roy Haynes actually sh showed up. But I was like 21 at the time. And Roy actually came up and sat, sat in, you know, on a song with us. But I don't think he remembered me, mm. you know, um, like five, what, I think it was, I guess it was five years later. But I had all these gigs. And then eventually the booking agent, Roy's booking agent called me and said, hey, Roy actually wants to hear you. Mm. You know, I know you have all these gigs, but Roy wants to hear you. So I drove up to Roy's house and um, we played duo for about an hour. We just played some tunes. Wow. And then we sat down and talked. And um, 
I'll never forget he sat and he talked talked to me about, you know, the first thing he said when he sat down, he said, you know, um, when I was around your age, maybe a little bit younger, um, Duke Ellington called me to to join his band, his big band. And I was like, really? He said, yeah. He said, Duke Ellington called me to join the orchestra and I um, I turned it down. Hmm. And I said, really? And he said, yeah, man. He said, you know, I knew what everyone was doing. You know, I, I knew every member of that band and I didn't think that my concept of playing would have been respectful to what they were doing. And he said, I had this sound in my ear, you know, at, in, in my head. I had this sound in my head. I knew what I was hearing and I, I didn't think it would, it would have fit. I didn't want to disrespect that music. Wow. And he said, not too long after that, Charlie Parker came around and it was just like, boom, that was it. And Charlie called him to do the gig and, you know, and I, I, I don't know what he was trying to tell me at that moment, but <laughs> that what I got from it was, you know, regardless of what the gig is, it has to be in your heart that this is the music that you want to play. Mm-hmm. You know, um, it doesn't matter, you know, how, how amazing the, the, the band leader is. Eventually it's about, does this music represent who I am and, mm-hmm. you know, what I want to do? Um, and I, you know, I, 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 I tell my students that, and I do say there are exceptions to that, you know, cause I do think you should play with as many people as possible. Yeah. And over time you might, might, you, you know, you might, th- that, that window might narrow to this kind of music you want to play. But I think it is, imp- is very important to play with as many, um, many people as, as, as you can, you know, when you're coming up. Mm-hmm. Uh, I want to ask you, uh, going way back from your beginning of when you were coming up with your mother, I know you have a really uh, strong relationship with her just uh, as as you were talking about her and Mm -hmm. how she really helped support the start of your career. I wanted to ask, because I'm just curious, uh, is she a musician herself? Is she in the arts in any way? Like what was her career? (laughs) Well, my mom actually, um, she, she 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 practices cello now she practices <laughs> and she probably practices in fact i know she practices way more than me <laughs> almost every time i call her she's like I, I i gotta go practice you know so you know but she you know she didn't grow up in music that much i mean i, I have a lot of singers in my family but my mom never really um she was i, I think she may have sang in some choirs when she was younger Mm. But she, you know, she she didn't uh, pursue like a career in music or anything like that. My grandfather actually was a, a great violinist, and um, he studied viol- He was he was like one of those kind of prodigies, and uh, he had to stop playing. His father got you know like deathly ill, and he had to stop playing. But my grandfather, um, the story is, my grandfather was a, a great violinist. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You also talk about, you mentioned how, uh, you mentioned that, that you were pretty close with Jonathan Blake, right? So when, when did your relationship with him start up? Was it in Philly? Yeah. So I, um, I have been playing for a couple, maybe, maybe two or three years, maybe more than that. Maybe I was around 13, 12, 13. And I was part of this youth ensemble that was run by a man named Lovett Hines, and um, a lot of great musicians have come through there. Um, and uh, one day his father, John Blake Jr., who's a great jazz viol- violinist, had a workshop. And I went to the workshop and Jonathan was there. And I played at this, this workshop and I got to talking to Jonathan after the workshop. And you know, I was just telling him, look, I'm part of this, this youth band. And you should come join. And um, you know, John Blake had his had Jonathan join the band and you know and that, that was it you know been playing together you know off and on since then <laughs> how old were you, know, you when that about, happened I was probably about 12 or 13 oh my goodness you know so you you've known yeah you've had a relationship with Jonathan for a few decades at this point right we're not going to say how old I am. Ah, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> no. I'm joking. Yeah, it, 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 yeah, about yeah, 
a few de- decades, mm-hmm. almost more than that. You know, are you guys the same age? He's a couple years older than me. Oh wow! How was that dynamic yeah. when you guys first met? Because at that age, it, it could be a, a few years can mean a lot. Yeah, um, that's you no, know that's true. But I never, you know, sometimes I forget how that, that he's a couple years older than me. Mm-hmm. You know, um, yeah, we. I mean, we were, we were. It was me, him, and there, there were some other young musicians that was around at that age, and we were, we were all really close. Like we used to call each other on the phone. You know, I we were all buying records like crazy at the time. And, you know, Jonathan was really into Art Blakey. He was buying the Art Blakey records. I was in the Wayne Shorter. I was buying the, the, the Wayne Shorter records. And our friend Daoud al Bakara was a trumpeter. Hmm. Well, he is a trumpeter and uh, he was in the Lee Morgan. So, you know, <laughs> we would call each other and play all of our, you know, play a, play play our records to each other and give, give each other, you know, um, records to check out you know wow. um but yeah i mean we, we 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 all hung together we 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 played i mean we were in the ensemble together so i saw him every weekend and we talked on the phone probably every other day mm, wow know? yeah you know that's interesting that you you mentioned can you repeat your your the trumpet player friend was in into lee morgan and you were you were into wayne shorter wayne shorter yeah. Yeah, I'm I was talking with Mike like some of my favorite memories that of our lessons and conversations have just been listening to just really swinging stuff, you know, <laughs> like Right, right, right. You know, yeah. and you've done a lot of stuff in your career from like hip hop to like more modern to like you know, original composition, but I I've always felt that like some when I've seen you the happiest is like when <laughs> This is going, you know, mm. and so I wonder if some of that stems from that time, you know, maybe that was like your, your first love with, with jazz or, um, is there you know something what? else about May- it? Yeah. I mean, those records are amazing for one, yeah, you know, the, the, I mean, for me, like those Wayne Shorter, early Wayne Shorter records, like those compositions, um, you know, a lot of those records from that period, Hank Mobley, um, uh, Art Blakey, but also, you know, I grew up in Philly and, you know, there was like a, a huge organ scene in Philly, you know, hmm. Shirley Scott, you know, Trudy Pitts, you know, you would go to the clubs and, you know, it would be this big, you know, Hammond organ there, you know, and that's what it was. It was swinging, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know? So, I mean, that, you know, I, I mean, yeah, I definitely love that music. Um, and I, I think that's something that, you know, we did a lot. You know, we we, we, we played a lot of standards, played a lot of, you know, the music from the 60s and late 50s. Um, but that being said, we were also, you know, we weren't always all only playing Wayne Shorter stuff. We, you know, I was listening to it. The Tribe Called Quest. I was a big Tribe Called Quest fan, and we were playing those records too. In fact, Jonathan borrowed my LL Cool J, Mama Said Knock You Out record, and I never got it back. I'll <laughs> never forget that. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I think that that was part of the Philly tradition, that that organ, and that's something that you know. Um, looking back, I even wish I took more advantage of. I didn't realize how strong it was until I left mm. and got to you know, Boston or, or even when I got to New York and, you know, when I realized what that scene was in Philly, I was like, man, I really wish I would have gone to those clubs. I mean, I was playing with Shirley Scott and Mickey Roker and, and, mm. and, 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 and um, uh, Arthur Harper and, uh, you know, Jimmy, Jimmy Oliver would come in who was one of the trained teachers. Um, I studied with another teacher that's, that um, taught tra- trained named Dennis Sandoli. And I didn't really understand what was going on. I mean, I have I have a notebook of some of the stuff that he gave me, but at, I was like 14, 15, you know, um, hanging with these people and, and learning things that, you know, I don't think I really, really, I'm, I'm not gonna say I didn't appreciate it, but I didn't really realize yeah, yeah. what it was, you know, until I got out and, and you know, I would go 
places and say I'm from Philly and people say, oh, Shirley Scott, you know, Mickey Roker and, you know, McCoy and, and Kenny Barron and, you know, and I'll be like, yeah, like I used to play with them all the time. Well, not McCoy and Kenny Barron, but <laughs> Shirley Scott and, and um, Mickey Roker, Bootsy Barnes, like these great musicians that just embraced me. Like they, I could call them anytime I wanted, mm. you know, um, and I could go to their gigs and, and, and play anytime I wanted. And it was just love, you know. Do you think Joey DiFrancesco is kind of like the modern continuation of that, like Philly? Absolutely, organ? absolutely, Anybody absolutely. Else? Um, of that of that sound from Philly, yeah. Uh, Christian McBride too. Mm. You know, they 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 definitely. Um, I mean, they, they they got to experience that too. Um, Joey, absolutely. Yeah. You know, and, and it's, it's deep because I feel like I need to listen to more of what Joey is doing because, you know, um, having seen him the past few times, you know, I realized like, oh, yeah, that's Philly, you know, mm. Mm. <laughs> and it's 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 it, it's a great feeling, you know, and it's it's a uh, it's like a nostalgic feeling, you know, when you when you when you hear that um you know, someone like Joey play or like Christian play. Yeah. When I've seen Christian McBride play, he I saw him play with his band called the New John. Right, right. And that's that's like a Philly term, right? Yeah, it is. John is a Philly term. <laughs> yeah. So what John does it mean? Is, John is anything. You know? <laughs> I like that John. You know. <laughs> like that like 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 that John is amazing. <laughs> you know. John is is anything and everything. That's what the that, that's what the definition of John is. <laughs> Are there yeah. any other Philly terms you could educate us with? Uh, huh. I don't know. John is the one I know is like Philly because when I got to Boston, I didn't know that it was only a Philly thing. <laughs> and when I started saying, in fact, I think the first time I said it, someone's like, oh, you must be Philly. You must be from Philly. Do you know blah, blah, blah? And they were telling me all the other Philly students that were already there at the school. Um, I can't think of anything else, any other terms. Maybe while I'm talking, I'll say something that, you yeah. know. <laughs> so maybe we can move on from Philly, which was seems like just an incredibly vibrant and formative scene for you uh mm. to your time in boston at berkeley uh yeah from what from what i remember you spent a lot of time studying like kenny garrett and ran for marsalis that type of uh like young lion type of music at that at that time is that correct well it was some of that but it was also a lot of like sunny stitt uh. a lot of johnny hodges a lot of uh cannonball a lot of those three you know, um, that's when I really started collecting those records when I was in at, at Berkeley, you know, and I was like, I mean, in fact, my a lot of my CD collection happened, started happening when I was at and I shouldn't say that because I was buying a lot of records in Philly. But when I when I was in Boston, I lived three blocks away from Tower Records. So that was pretty, pretty uh, crazy because I was literally in Tower Records almost every day buying something, you know. Um, but yeah, I did listen to, like, I was really absorbing a lot of music right then, you know, um, I had just really started checking out Kenny, um, Kenny Garrett. And I had listened to a lot of Bramford when I was in college, I mean, in, in high school. So I was still checking him out. And also, um, Steve Coleman, listened right, to a lot right. of Steve Coleman, um, and also got into a Lee, Lee Konitz. The, the funny thing is probably the, the last person that I really, 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 really got into heavily was Charlie Parker. And that wasn't until like probably near the end of my, you know, wow. of, of, of my four years. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. How did you come to get into these these different people like Kenny Garrett, Branford, Marsalis? And like, yeah, like if they're from high school, how how did you develop an interest in them? How did you find out about them? And, and also in college, was it the same process for you finding out new people to check out? Well, in high school and even before high school, um, you know, it goes back to my mom. Like when I was a kid, 
Wow. My mom had this record collection. I'll never forget. She had a record collection of Yusef Latif, Farrell Sanders, Jeez. John Coltrane, Miles Davis, Ornette Coleman. Oh. Um, <laughs> she had some Prince. She had some Michael Jackson. Um, she had some Stravinsky. She had, you know, Bob Marley. And she was like just, you know, she was just playing, just playing music, you know, playing music all the time. And eventually when I started playing, she was buying, you know, um, I think one of the first, she, she I, I'll never forget, she joined this. There used to be these like CD clubs or like tape clubs that you can join, um, like Columbia House tape clubs. And you could get like, you would get like, when you join the membership, you could pick 10, 10 uh, albums to get for free. And then you had to buy like an album a month or something like that. Mm. So she started getting like the young lions at the time you know um roy hargrove i remember she had diamond in the rough and she played that tape all the time wow you know i must have been like 13 14 but i knew that record you know i, I probably learned that whole record just from listening to it so much yeah. you know and she had branford marcellus crazy people music she played that a lot um she played branford marcellus trio gp a lot um <laughs> When Marcellus, Standard Time, like I was hearing all of that, you know. Um, and so I was hearing a lot of like Roy Hargrove and Antonio Hart. And when I got to, um, I, I was listening to that. And, you know, when I got uh, to know Jonathan and, and um, Daoud more, you know, they were in, like Jonathan. Actually, the funny thing about like, like say like someone like Kenny Garrett, I... I also had a friend that worked, a friend of a friend in elementary school actually worked for the radio station, the jazz radio station in Philly, WRTI. And when she saw that I was playing, you know, like later on, in fact, in fact I, I was friends with this guy in elementary school before I even started playing, but I met her when I was like a kid and she saw later on that I was still playing. So she, she started sending me all of the promos, like the extra promos that the radio station was getting. Mm. So anything that came from Verve, anything that came from Warner Brothers, anything that came from Blue Note, anything that came from, you know, any of the major and minor labels, I was getting the second copy in the mail, like once or twice a week. Oh, wow. You know, so that was a beautiful thing. Like her, her name is Kim, Kim Berry. Like I, 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 I need to thank her again mm. because I learned so much you know, and I list, and, and I had all these records, and it's funny because I'll never forget. Like I must have put Kenny Garrett on really quick and not really paid attention to it. And I think during that time, like Triology came out, and I think I didn't really, really like pay attention to it. And I had it, and I listened to it, and I just kept listening to everything else. Yeah. And um, like Triology was probably Kenny Garrett's like breakout record. Mm -hmm. You know, that was the one that everyone was hyped about, and. I'll never forget Jonathan calling me and saying, hey, man, have you heard of this guy, Kenny Garrett? Have you have you checked him out? And uh, I said, yeah, I, I have the record. It's, you know, it's cool. It's cool. He said, no, man, go listen to it again. Go listen to it again. <laughs> <laughs> and I listened to it again. And I like when I listened to it again, I was like, whoa, like, wow. That's a new. It was a new sound at that point. It was yeah, now everybody's was a, trying to do that, but it was a new sound. It was like it was like whoa, whoa. This is this is deep. This is deep. So that was um, for me. That was like one of the things that got me into Kenny was like you know that you know going back and listening to that trilogy record, which I which I had for free, and I, I got a lot of those. You know, I got a lot of those records for free. But um, I have to go back and say actually. Another person that my mom introduced me to was um, the music of, and, and actually, I'm not sure if my mom, so basically in Philly, this is another thing, great thing about Philly is that there were these workshops in Philly and every musician that came down from New, from New York had to give a workshop for most of the places that they performed. They had to do a workshop for, for the, um, the, the students and, and, or, or the young, um, artist in, in Philly. So I met a lot of great musicians and I got to sit in with a lot of great musicians from New York just because I would go to these workshops and, you know, they would invite us to, to, to sit in. 
and one great musician that came down that has become like a role model, like a, a father figure to me is a uh, great Bobby Watson. Mm. I was like, probably, I don't know. I was 13, 14 and he came down to do a master class, and um, you know what? I think my mom did did buy that album first because I now, now when I think about it, I was I was a fan by the time he came down, you know. But I listened to those records like, you know, obsessively. You know, I listened to I used to buy like every Bobby Watson record and wow. listen and listen and listen, and you know, he came in town. I did the workshop. He invited me to sit in. And, you know, my mom would put me on the train. The first time I took a train to New York was to go hang out with Bobby Watson. And he, and and um and my mom was nervous. I remember my mom was scared because I think I was like 13, 14, but I had never taken a train that far. And she put me on a train in New York and he picked me up from the train station. And, you know, we walked around and um, that may have been one of my first times in New York, actually. Mm-hmm. You know, he gave me a lesson and put me back on the train. But we've been, you know, we've been close ever since, you know, as I think he's one of the musicians, one of the musicians that I speak to the most, you know, um, now. Yeah. Wow. Man, that, that's just, I'm, I'm like, I'm like drooling. Your mom had like the most epic record collection <laughs> I think I've ever heard of. Like, yeah. End she, of an age. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just yep. imagining how, nourishing that would be for a 13 year old your mom yeah. scheduling a lesson for you with bobby watson and right right the, yeah. the, the radio shows it just sounded like like you know typically we might ask like oh how how did uh when did you decide to make music a, a career or like dedicate your life to this but it sounded like there was like no other choice it was not choice, <laughs> but like the whole universe was like pointing you towards the music <laughs> exactly yeah i would say so i would say so it's it's funny because when i first picked the saxophone um so basically when i was in third grade a guy came to our school and he showed us there's a disney video i'm sure it's on youtube that shows the evolution (laughs) of musical instruments this is cartoon that comes on before fantasia and it's the evolution of musical instruments and um this guy showed us the video and, you know, afterwards he said, okay, who wants to play a musical instrument? And, you know, I raised my hand and I was like, you know, I, I want to play. And he said, okay, go home and talk to your mom. And when I went home and talked to my mom, I, I said, I wanted to play drums first. Mm-hmm. And she said, no, that's too loud. And then I said, trumpet. And I think she said, no, that's too loud. And then I said, saxophone. And she was like, okay. Huh. <laughs> so I'm wondering, that that makes me wonder, you know, did my mom want me to play saxophone all along? Did, did she have, <laughs> was this all set up? <laughs> did she set me up? You know, cause she, she the, the majority of her records in the house um, of, of, of the, the jazz records are actually saxophonists, you know, Ornette, Pharaoh, Youssef Latif, um, you know, Miles with Cannonball and Train, and you know she had the she had like some of the out Train records. Like I shouldn't say out, but the more free Train records. Wow. You know she had the more free stuff. So when I was a kid, before I started playing, when I was putting these records on, I was like, wow, man, like my mom is like really, <laughs> she's out you, there, man. <laughs> what, what did you think of those free Train records when you were hearing them at like thirteen years old? Man, I, they were just completely out to me. Oh, like you, you I, like didn't I understand didn't. them yet either. No, no, no. Oh, okay. Uh-huh. And, 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 and no, I shouldn't say when I was 13. I think when I was 13, maybe I was closer to getting into it. But I honestly didn't really even check out a Love Supreme until like late in my high school years, you know, and I didn't really, really, really get into it like until I was in college. Like when I was in college, that's when I was like obsessively listening to a Love Supreme like every day for like a couple of months, you know. Wow. Oh. Yeah. Uh, so I actually I was listening to this interview you did a couple of days ago, and right. I was really intrigued. Yeah, I think it's is that jazz radio, right? right that was right, like two yeah. days ago, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so you guys got on a really interesting discussion, and I kind of wanted to continue the discussion a little bit just to like ask you a couple more questions about it. But it has to do sure. because right now we're talking about how you were exposed at a really young age to like very 
you know, like arguably like super great music, you know, like right. that, that kind of got you onto this career path that you are on now, you know, and I wanted to ask you, uh, just because the, the guy you were talking to, actually, he was saying how he is a teacher and a middle school teacher, and he was saying how next door there was the band room and all these kids uh, were just listening to Adele, you know, like pop music like that, and they weren't getting exposed to other kinds of music that maybe they can relate to more or have or have or different cultures that mm-hmm. that can show them how different cultures can can come and and create other types of beautiful music and it doesn't just need to be one pop genre that the kids are listening to so uh i i know now you're teaching at the collegiate level and and i mean everyone that that's going to come to manhattan school of music or new school you know they they have that drive in them already of wanting to be a jazz right. musician they they already have a love right. for the music but mm-hmm. From a young age, how can schools, you think, better foster a love or at least an interest to kids, at least to give them the opportunity to check out more cultures from a younger age, you know, understand different musics better and and different art forms? Well, you know, it's it's about, you know, diversity and you know one thing Stefan Harris used to say to me you know when we talked about you know um uh social justice or anything is like inclusion you know inclusion we are in this amazing melting pot of you know the United States of America where people have come here some of them brought here against their will mm. but people are, are are here from all over the world all over the world when i travel when i go to europe when i go to asia when i go to uh uh, africa there's no place where you where you can walk down the street and see five or six different cultures in three or four minutes there's no place like that you know maybe in france or, or or paris maybe a major city like paris but you know even major cities like tokyo or or, or, or even, you know, some places in, in you know, and in, 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 in maybe London, but I think there's no place like the United States when it comes to being a melting pot and it comes to the history of this country. There's just so much, there's just so much in this country. And I think that the problem is, for me, is, 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 is history, you know, the history of this country. Look at all the amazing cultures that have you know, helped make this country what it is, you know, especially the African American culture, especially the 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 the, the, the black culture. Um, when I was coming up in elementary school, I didn't learn anything about who I was out you know, in school. I learned everything about who I was from home. You know, and I think that speaks a lot to everything that's going on with this country now is that it's not only about me learning about who I am, it's about the other kids, you know, the white kids and the, the Hispanic kids learning about who I am. It's about us learning about who the who the uh, Hispanic kids are and, 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 and how and what they brought to this country, you know, and, 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 and about what, you know, what it truly means to be a Native American, you know, that's not taught in, in history. Um, in the music classes, I didn't learn about Duke Ellington. No way. You know, I, no way. I didn't learn about Thelonious Monk. I didn't learn about Charlie Parker. You know, um, I didn't learn about James Brown. I learned about Mozart and Beethoven and Bach. You know, so I think that until like the his, the true history of this country is embraced, you know, we're going to be. I, I feel like we're we're everyone is set back. You know, I think a lot of things, a lot, a lot of what's going on in, in this country today is, is, is just because of education and, and, and ignorance. But I think that, you know, um, if people were to truly understand what people have done or gone through in the history of this country, what the African Americans have gone through in the history of this country, what the Native Americans have gone through in the history of this country, and what everyone has contributed to this country. If that was to someday happen in education, not just in music, but in art, 
you know, I, I, I was just talking to one of my one of my band instructors growing up is actually an art teacher, too. And I told him, man, I realized I don't really know that much about African-American artists. You know, I don't know that much about African artists. A lot of the famous artists that I know about are European mm-hmm. that, that, that are celebrated. You know, I don't know that much about Asian artists. And, 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 and why is that? I'm sure there, there are great artists coming out of Africa and in and, 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 and China and, and Japan. Why don't I know about that? you know, or, 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 or Chinese American or African American. I mean, I, I know about the African American composers, but I really feel like there's so much that we don't know about each other, you know? And I think that's, that's once that starts and once the children start learning about, you know, the true culture, the true American culture, then it can't be as controlled as it is. And I think now, you know, when you turn, turn on the radio, you know, you're, you're not hearing everything that this country is, mm. you know, same thing with turning on the TV. You know, you're not seeing everything that this country is. You're not given the truth of what it is. And I think that that's and, 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 and I'm not saying I shouldn't say the truth, because what you do here is American culture, but you're not hearing everything. You're not getting the big picture. And I think the big picture is 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 what's beautiful, you know, and I think that's that's when that's that's when that's what's going to get us to understand each other. You know, yeah. Even in certain fields, though, like, like I do understand what you're saying about getting exposed to all this type of art, and I think that is a beautiful thing to to be exposed to that. But I think that an issue with schools, or not an issue, but just overall, it's it's a lot of times just a gloss over of a lot of different topics, just because they don't have enough time to cover all of it. But I do agree, though, that a lot of it is, it, and it can be from, a, I guess, a Eurocentric model, you know, like, like the, way, the way music is, is taught in theory class, for instance. Uh, it starts with Bach, and it goes with other European composers. Do you think that is the basis for music nowadays, or would you disagree with that statement? Ask, ask the question again. I, I, I don't understand what your question is, I guess. Well, the way, the way I feel that music is taught nowadays and perceived is how a lot of the basis of it comes from Europe, I guess with the harmony, for instance, and that seems to be the base, at least in my mind, the way, the way a lot of schools teach it, you know, like the base is Bach. And then it kind of stems outward from that, at least certain types of music. But what what do you think about that statement? I think that that's that that can only be based on one's knowledge of of that. If you only know about Bach and you don't know about what was going on in 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 Africa harmonically, if you don't know about what was going on in in, in Japan or 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 China or or anyone else and anywhere else, you know, and what their concepts were, just like for instance. When I started studying with Dennis Sandoli, this is one of the guys that taught John Coltrane. His concept was like, it was like world music. All the scales he was giving me were, he had a, and he, he, were, he, were, he were right. Uh, Lebanese scale, Japanese scale, mm. Chinese scale. And I was just like, <laughs> all I knew was about the modes, yeah. Greek modes. So I didn't know what he was talking about. He wrote a book too, right? The Thor- the source of of scales. I th- no, you, 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 I think that's um, that's Slonimsky. Oh, right. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Sandoli was a was a teacher in Philly. He was a he was like a a, har- a harmony and com- composition teacher in Philly. Um, but you know, I'm I'm saying all that to say. Like the one thing that you said, you said that, you know, there isn't enough time to teach all of these things. I think there is. I think there is enough time to teach. I, I think it's it's I think it's based on how you present it, you know. And I think that that's very important. It's very important. If there's enough time to teach about Bach and about Beethoven and Mozart and, 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 if, and if I can go to every school, uh, elementary school and ask the kids about composers you know and and a bulk of them know about Bach Mozart and 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 and, and uh, Beethoven or if I ask them about 
uh, artists and the bulk of them know about Picasso and Van Gogh and uh, Henry Matisse, someone that I was taught about. They're actually one of my favorite composers based on my, under my knowledge of composers. I mean, of, of uh, artists, you know, if those kids can know about Bach, Beethoven, and Mozart, they can know about Charlie Parker, Duke Ellington, Count Basie, mm. Thelonious Monk. They can know about the composers, uh, um, especially in this country. You know, they can know about um, Wilmer Bearden. They can know about um, uh, Basquiat. You know, it's important. And you know, and I'm and I'm 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 I'm, I'm talking about the African American um, artists because that's very important to me, and that's a big part of American culture. But yeah. the bigger picture is there were people that came from all over this world that 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 contributed to this country, and you know, contribute to the culture of this country. So that's I think that's the thing that that that's the big 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 elephant in the room, you know is, you know, to this day, you know, we're, there are things that, that, that need to happen or things that haven't been exposed to, you know, you know children aren't, ch the children are, are, or even, you know, adults. We don't know things that I think will change our perspective on the world, you know, traveling. Yeah. As soon as I, the first time I went to Europe, the first time I went to Japan, and just saw like a completely different culture that I had never seen before. You know, I went to Morocco, completely different culture. Uh, uh, I went to Israel and, and did a tour, uh, did like a, a, a tour that took me to um, Palestine. And I didn't, I didn't realize Bethlehem was part of Pal was Palestine. So I, I'm doing this tour of Jerusalem. You know, I got, I, I paid for this tour <laughs> and all of a sudden, you know, they said, you got your passport? And I say, yeah. And they said, we can't go over there. You have to go, you have to, you have to cross the border yourself. And I crossed the border, these guys with these big machine guns. And I get over to the other side of the wall and it's another world completely that people haven't, you know, people don't know about. Mm -hmm. And I think that if people were to see all these, and I think that's the thing I'm the most thankful about mm -hmm you know, or I, one of the things is just being able to travel and getting, a underst getting to understand the different perspectives around the world is amazing. It's amazing to see how people live, to see how people eat, to pe see the music that people live to listen to, to see the religions that people have, and to understand that th there are so many similarities <laughs> between us. Yeah. And we still can't get we, we we can't work it out. We can't work things out, you know. But I think that if people were to travel and were to see under truly understand, you know, how people live and 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 and, and the different perspectives, and we're and we're able to have empathy, I really think the world would be a much better place, you know. And I think that that's something starting with this country. If we just, just if we even if, if we were to broaden people's perspective in this country about the people that live in this country <laughs> and and our culture as Americans, man, it would so much would change, you know, so much would change, and I, and I think that's a big that's a big problem with I think our country, and that's something that I, you know, as an educator, I do try to keep my students like open. You know, I hope I have. I hope I, I hope I've encouraged encouraged you to do that, Austin. No doubt, no doubt. <laughs> well, is, is are these type of ideas on your mind when you're making music, like soundtrack of things to come? Is that at all a message about what you see in the future, or hope for the future, or the wheel? Um, of, you know, it, it, do you compose and? with these type of more uh, uh, tangible ideas in mind? You know what? Um, I would say the soundtrack of things to come was my personal, this is what I'm going through. This is my, <laughs> this is my life album at the time. Mm. Like, you know, soundtrack of things to come was like so much, that, so much was going on in my life at that time that, um, and I, I called it that, 
because a lot of the music that I wrote during that time um, spoke to things that happened almost immediately after I composed some of the music, you know, like I started going through things after I composed some of that music that um, when I listened back to the tunes, I was able to, to, uh, you know, um, or maybe, I, maybe as I played the music, the, the titles came for that. Hold on. I, I, I have a package coming. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. We can take a short break. Can we take a break? Yeah, we can do that. We can play a track or something. Oh, I have a pack. You know what? I think I can get to the door. If you don't mind me just running to the door when it when it comes in. Okay, uh, yeah, sure. Of course. Okay. Of course. <laughs> gotta do what you gotta do. We're living life. We're living life. But yeah, that that's basically what happened with that. Um, you know, with that album. I I I and and you know, I called it that. Like uh, one thing that happened was I I I lost my father and um my father and I weren't close and I have a half sister, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's his, um, his daughter. Mm -hmm. And, but we're not close to him. And, um, she always wanted to have a relationship with him. I kind of did. She, she didn't get to have it. And, you know, we, we, we were talking a lot, um, right before he passed and we didn't even know that he was sick we, we, we were hearing from time well we didn't know he was sick we didn't know how sick he was we heard from time to time that he was sick but you know we didn't have any connection to him we, we have any we didn't have that kind of relationship with him and she told me when she if anything ever happens to him don't tell me if you ever hear anything don't tell me because mm. i had never got to have the relationship that i wanted with him and i just want to just imagine that one day i will even though it just can't happen. Wow. And when I got the call that he had passed, I had forgotten that she told me that. And she and I and I called her and I told her, you know, that I just passed and she broke. She took it really bad. She broke down and she said, I really didn't want to know that. You know, I wish I didn't know that. And, you know, mm. that became the title of my first song. I, you know, I, 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 I mean, the first the, the, the first song on the album is I wish I didn't know. Yeah. Um, I could probably speak about every song on that album because so many of that, so much of that music represents something I went through in life, and I really took that time to really just like, like that's those those are a lot of strong emotions. Hold on, this package is here. <laughs> One second, I'm sorry. Yeah. Wow, well, it's, it's sobering. We 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 were just, Mike and I were just talking earlier today about how much you liked. I w I wish, I wish I didn't know. Or I wish you didn't yeah. know. Yeah, that's true. Or I, I wish listening. you didn't tell me. <laughs> my my fault. Yeah, I was listening to that album earlier today. Did you know? Could you feel like something heavy in that, or you, or yeah? Did you, did you, imagine anything like that behind it? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, it's definitely abstract to hear music and to get such a. It's hard for me to pinpoint such a specific emotion. Yeah, of course. You know, but definitely I felt like it was really intense and there was a lot of emotion behind what was going on in it as well. I mean, I mean, in, in particular, actually, about that track, I really, I loved, like, I was just like, whoa. Like, like I was just, in, I guess, like, like with you and Jonathan Blake playing together on that track, I was just pretty amazed. At that whole, uh, we were talking about the track, uh, on 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 the the first track on that record. Oh, the wish I didn't know. I wish I didn't know. Yeah. 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 I I you know that was one of those things where I I even and it, it's funny because when I play it with other people and, that, and that's one thing about some music, um, and I actually I, I'm not kind of answer your question. The answer to what you asked me, uh, uh, Austin, is optimism. Optimism is that album that I said. Ah. This is me. Like this is this is I'm I'm just going. I'm this is everything that I am. Everything, every music that I love, every music that you know. I mean, every style of music that I love. You know, this is this is me. You know, yeah. the soundtrack of things that come was very personal. Um, and going back to that that first song, it's funny because I've. I've played it um, with different bands and, you know, I, I realized that 
I have to like I, I I sit with the people that if if I play some of those tunes during the rehearsal, I'll explain what the music is about because um, I think that's some some sometimes the best way to kind of understand um, what the energy is of of, of, of the music, you know, yeah. what the story is. Um, Linda O, I, Linda O uh, was one of the. I mean, I, I recorded with Boris uh, Kozlov, but. Later on, when um, I started using Linda, I, I remember I um, and she actually wrote something about this. She wrote an article about, you know, understanding the music um, and understanding what the message is behind the music, because she was playing the music in a way that didn't lend itself to what this what, 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 what the song was about. And I pulled her to the side and I said, hey, Linda, this song is actually about, you know, loss. You know, it's about loss. and you know, about things that I went through in my life. And, you know, I, I, I told her about, you know, and it, it's not even about my dad. It was just that, like that year was just so crazy, you know, so, so much was going on. And, um, you know, I, I, I told her the story of, of, you know, what happened with my father and she went back and we played it and it was like, boom, this is it. You know, like, like she, she, she was able to, it, music is about empathy, you know, so she was able to <laughs> to empathize, yeah. you know, with, with what, what we had gone through. Um, so that was that kind of record. And I, 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 um, I wasn't thinking about like uh, my influences or anything like that. I was just creating for that album. Optimism was, I just want to do whatever, you know, and I was like hanging out with, you know, Robert was on my album, Robert Glass was on the album, and we were hanging and, you know, talking about Dilla and everyone was listening to, to Dilla. And, you know, I was just like writing as freely as, <laughs> you know, I could. I wasn't thinking about genre. I wasn't thinking about anything. I just wanted to write some music and, and, and play, mm. you know. And so. Soundtrack of Things to Come, that's 2012 and that's 2013 2013 and then yeah, optimism was seven before years. that optimism is 2008 and eight yeah yeah and yeah, was yeah. that around well help, help me understand the time because you've told me about a, a time period when you were in grad school at manhattan school of music you were hanging with robert glasper quite a bit sitting in yeah. at his gigs and that yeah. that helped you um yeah and get going in, in, in new york right yeah was that definitely. around the same time or later uh that was no well that was around 2003 that i i, I really was like really really like hanging in and i was at school still at school. well no i graduated from manhattan school of music in 2002. Mm. my first record perspective came out in 2005. so that was around the time um you know, I was really hanging and going to different gigs and sitting in, you know, like Robert's gigs and Marcus Strickland's gigs and just going and sitting in, you know, and that kind of helped get my ball rolling. You yeah. Know? Can we talk a little bit about that? Your peers, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, I've from my, my impression was that Berkeley was like a crazy hopping place when you were there. <laughs> yeah, York, it was crazy. New York as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Who who were. I mean, you mentioned Robert and Marcus Strickland, but uh, yeah, who who were the people, your cohorts that are now uh, enshrined a bit <laughs> in the scene? Well, when I was when I was at Berkeley, um, when I was at Berkeley, I was there with you know Warren Wolf was there, Kendrick Scott, mm. Walter Smith, uh, Miguel Zanon, uh, Dana Stevens. Uh, <laughs> Lionel Lueke. Entire MSM uh, Sachs faculty, right? There. <laughs> right. <laughs> Minus right. Donnie. And that's right. It. <laughs> right. Well, Donnie went to Berkeley too, but he went there, I think, way before we, we went there. Um, Anat Cohen, Avishai Cohen. Um, my roommate, uh, uh, his name is, he called himself Natural. His name is Johnny Nahara. He, he's like a big uh md now he, he he does you know i think he does the voice he does that show he does he's like ariana grande's um md oh wow uh, i'm 
trying to think. Uh, Rashawn Ross plays with Dave Matthews Band now. Um, I don't want to leave anyone out, but there were there were a lot of people at Berkeley. Berkeley was just crazy. It yeah. was crazy, <laughs> you know. And it was really in, in inspiring because you know everyone that I named, like we did sessions together all the time. You know, we were always playing together and subbing for each other's bands, and you know it was just a great time. And um, then when I moved to to um, when I moved to Manhattan School, when, when I went to move to uh, New Jersey slash New York and um, started going to Manhattan School of Music, um, I was at Manhattan School of Music with, well, Miguel was ahead of me. So I think he may have just graduated from Manhattan or, or, or maybe he was, yeah, he was there like the last year. He had some stuff to finish up. Will Vincent was there. Ambrose Second Musery was there. Obed Calvert was there. Um, I'm trying to think of who else was there. I, I hate leaving people out. Uh, Tim Green was there. Mm. Um, John, I think John Aravagon was there. Maybe he, he came a little bit later. But it was a that was a great scene too. But but you know, just in New York, you know, Robert was there. Robert Glasper, Marcus, and EJ Strickland, Mike Marino, um, Lage Lund moved down um, from from Boston. It was just you know. It, it was crazy because we were hanging. <laughs> yeah. When I say hanging, I mean, we. there was a club called the Up and Over um, Jazz Cafe in Brooklyn. And like Monday was like the hang night. So sometimes we would, um, or usually we would all go to Up and Over. And Up and Over started like around 11, 12 o'clock. <laughs> that jam session went to like 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. Then we would all head over to the Zinc Bar. You know, and we would hang at the zinc bar until like six in the morning, and you know, um, and and the hangs were just like almost every night after some gig, we, we were hanging, you know, going to some session and playing or just just hanging. So, um, the camaraderie at that time was like it was pretty amazing, you know, like um, and we were just playing all the time. <laughs> playing all the time and you know it wasn't too many people vincent herring ran 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 the jam session at the up and over and vincent used to kick my butt like you know his band would have a set before the um his band would have a set before the jam session started yeah and he would always tell me like man get here early so you can come play with us and every week he would he would give me something to learn. He'll give me a chart. Man, learn this for next week. Learn this for next week. So it was almost like a lesson. <coughs> he would he would give me some charts, and uh, he would email me, and tell me about my playing, like some things I need to work on. You know, yeah. we never really talked in person, but I, I remember him emailing me a couple of times, telling me things. Wow. And um, it was great. It was great. It was really. I'm I'm really thankful for those moments. I'm having some deja vu because like. Now he does the the session at Smoke, yeah. and his band plays before, and he right. he like told me to learn this like random Hank Mobley tune. I was like, what is this this tune? Nobody plays this tune. And like, right, right. He told that's me, that's exactly what? what he did. <laughs> he was, then he would say like, is, is that a new horn? Uh, I don't know how I feel about that one, Austin. <laughs> yeah. That's I'm Vincent. Like, <laughs> That's yeah, I, I, sh I should be soaking it up, you know. Yeah, soak it up, man. Soak it up. I used to go over Vincent's house, and you know, we would he would show me mouthpieces. We would go over mouthpieces. Um, Vincent Herring, you know, guys like that. Um, Myron Walden uh, have been like mentors to me, man. You know, of course, Bobby Watson. Um, like I, I call you Gary Bartz. Lee, you know, Lee Konitz is another one. I mean, that's that's to me, the Lee Konitz one is huge too because that was one of my heroes, big time. You know, listening to him. That's another person I started checking out when I was at when I was at Berkeley. And um, I I think maybe it was Miguel's and I because Miguel and I would be in the practice rooms next to each other and we would sometimes share together and just talk about what we're listening to and he told me about motion i think he made i think it was miguel that told me about motion yeah. maybe it was someone else but i went and i bought motion 
and mine was blown. <laughs> Man, mine was so blown. cool. Like I had a cl- good friend, a uh, classmate of mine, like freshman year, showed me motion, and my mind was blown. It's like, <laughs> yes, <laughs> the, that's the lineage. Got to, got to pass it down. You know. Yeah. What was your relationship with Lee Konitz? I met I met Lee at the Jazz Gallery uh, around the time that I moved to New York. Um, and it, it could have been maybe after I had been there a couple of years. Maybe it was 2000, 2003. I met Lee and uh, he was playing at the Jazz Gallery. And, um, you know, when I was younger, I asked, I would ask everyone for a lesson. Everyone, you know, especially the masters. And, uh, you know, I, I I I was quite quite courage, uh, courageous at the time, looking back, because I'm like, man, I don't know if I would do that now. But I went, I, I met him, and immediately I said, "Can I have a lesson?" And he said, "Yeah, I'm I'm around. You know, come by. You know, I'll give you a lesson." And I thought, great, you know. And I um, called him, went by his house, and um, we played duo, and um, you know. I remember hearing him play and you know I had I had listened to some of the records um that he did with Brad and you know um the, like the later records he did with Brad and Paul Motion and stuff and and um and I realized that he was more of the minimal he was more of a minimalist you know older he got he wasn't playing as much you know and I asked him about it. I said, man, you're not, you're, you're, um, I said, how did you get to plan your ideas that way? And he said, man, I'm really trying to play. He, he, no, he said, I'm basically trying to say the least amount of words and have more of an impact with what I'm saying. And when he said that, I was just like, wow. You know, and I, the more I pay attention to his phrases, I realized his phrases were, that every phrase that he played was strong. Yeah, you know, it was really strong. So, um, and really profound. So, so yeah, so so we had that, that 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 um, that hang, and we went out to eat afterwards, and we talked. You know, I remember we went to get sushi around the corner. From I have a picture of us. We went to get sushi around the corner, and we just talked and talked, and it was just like, man, like I'm sitting here with Lee Konitz. You know, he was like the most humble man. He was so, you know, he was funny. And we just sat and talked. And then, you know, later on, I, I would call him. He'd say, hey, you want to come over or whatever? And I would go over and he would play me some recording that he had just done. I think he did something with one of the orchestras. And I forget which or- orchestra it was, uh, Danish orchestra. And he would play me like the whole album. We would sit and listen to it, you know. Wow. Um, he played me the new record, one of the new records that he did on, like one of the last records he did on ECM. He played that. He would play stuff, and we would just sit and talk, you know. And then eventually, we would go listen to music, and that was hilarious because, <laughs> you know, uh, Lee was rarely highly opinionated. So mm-hmm. if he didn't like something, it was time to go, you know. It, it was really time to go. So there would be a couple of moments when we would be uh, <laughs> at a club, and you know, I would be listening to the music or I, I would just, you know, I'd be into the music listening and I would turn my head and look at him and he would just be staring at me, <laughs> which meant it's time to go. <laughs> like, I'm not feeling this. <laughs> and, uh, wow. you know, and sometimes he would whisper, can we go? <laughs> you know, but he was great, man. Lee was like, he was just an amazing, amazing, amazing human being. You know, I'm I'm so thankful that I got to know him. I'm so glad that I asked him for a lesson that time. You know, because um, those are the people that make a huge, and it's it's not even so much. Of course, this is playing because he was a hero of mine, but just the friendship and the mentorship, and you know, the openness. Like he he was he was supportive, and you know, I would look out in the audience at some of my gigs with Roy or with Tom Harrell, and Lee would be there, you know, mm-hmm. out in the audience, you know, and, um, you know, he would walk to gigs. He would, he would walk to gigs and be like, and telling me I'm, I'm walking back home from like 45th Street to like 90, not, not 90, I guess. Yeah, I think he lived around 95th Street. You know, he was just, he was just a, he was, he was a rare guy, really amazing.
person. Were, were Tom yeah. Harrell and Lee Konitz friends? I think they were. I don't. Um, I'm pretty sure they were. I'm, I'm not sure if they recorded together, but Lee did come to hear us at the Blue Note. I played at at um, the Blue Note with 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 uh, with Tom, and sure enough, look out in the audience, and there goes Lee, and he yeah. came and talked. Yeah. Maybe we can talk about um, your time playing with Tom, and uh, yeah, that group with with Jonathan Blake, Esperanza, uh, Wayne Escoffrey, was it? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that group is, has a very special sound. But I, and recently, you told me that one of your favorite things about the gigs was hearing Tom just blow over rhythm changes or blues at the end of a set. Can you talk <laughs> about what was so hitting about that? Um, I mean, hearing Tom play on anything was pretty amazing, you know. Um, but, you know... I, I, I guess it was this ultra extra special to hear him play on the rhythm changes because this is you know these are change, you know some of the songs that he wrote we were still getting familiar with them you know mm. we're, we're still learning them and we didn't I mean we we basically we recorded that album in like 2013 then we did a week no we did a week at the Vanguard and then we recorded the album and then we didn't play again for like a year and then the next year when the re when the record came out we did a tour, we did a tour of Europe and a tour of, um, of the States, um, well, some places in the States, but, you know, we're still trying to figure out those changes. And of <laughs> course, Tom, Tom is killing those tunes, but then when you play a rhythm change <laughs> and you play the blues and you hear what Tom plays on the blues, um, I think what amazed me about Tom always was like his strong connection to like the lineage of the music and his ability to like, like you hear the lineage, but it's Tom, it's mm. Tom Harrell, you know? And that's the same thing with, with, with Roy Haynes. Like, you know, Roy's played with everyone from Lester Young to Charlie Parker to, to now, but when yeah. you hear Roy play, it's still so very modern, you know? Even with Sarah Vaughn. <laughs> You're right, with Sarah Vaughn, you know? It's still so very modern. And that's the same, you know, I think that's what I think about um, Tom too. Like, you know, when I really, really like check out, listen to, to Bebop and listen to the Bebop players that I, that I really love, the, um, especially the unsung heroes, like the John Jenkins, mm. you know, um, um, uh, Sonny Red, you know, those alto players. Um, or when I think about Kenny Dorham, you know, um, uh, Red Mitchell, you know, I, I yeah. like you can tell that Tom embraced everything like he like he studied the music, you know, and now he has his sound like this is his approach to 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 bebop. And I, I think that's something I've always appreciated about Tom, his like consistency and his accuracy, his phrasing, you know. It's so amazing. So to hear him play on the rhythm changes, it's like every time, like, you know, and I, I mean, we're all excited to be on the stage playing Tom's music because he's an amazing composer, mm -hmm. you know. And then when he and then and then at the end of the set, if, if we have, you know, 10 more minutes, he'll say, OK, let's just play a blues. And, <laughs> you know, he stretches and it's just like, oh, my God, it's it's <laughs> it's, it's it's amazing. And, you know, I mean, we're always screaming, you know, and yelling while he's playing because he sounds amazing, you know. And when he gets to this blues and he really stretches, because sometimes his songs are like the, the forms are kind of like for the pieces of a dream, pieces of a dream. That's a band for the colors of a dream album. Um, all the solos were kind of like constructed within the, the the song, so we all we all knew how many choruses we had for the most part. When it got to the blues and the rhythm changes, Tom was stretching, yeah. you know, and amazing. I mean, there are some great videos of YouTube on on YouTube of Tom playing like blues blues and rhythm changes. And, yeah, yeah. I want to ask you. Uh, I'm really curious to know the differences and similarities that you find in the rehearsal process for all these different bands you're in, such as uh, Nate Smith, Kinfolk, the Roy Haynes band, and, and also what you, what you were just talking about, Tom Harrell band. So what are some differences, similarities you think in the rehearsal experience and 
traveling with the musicians and in the music that itself? Um, the rehearsal experience with, well, for, with Roy Haynes, there, there, there's no, there's no rehearsal experience. I, um, when I got that gig, the, the, the booking agent basically sent me all of Roy Haynes' CDs. And I had to, <laughs> I, I, yeah. And I had, I had to learn all the music that way. Oh. So once I got on the stage, it was like, okay, he was just calling tunes and I just had to learn them. I just had to know the, the music. Um, and, you know, with Roy, we, 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 you know, a ballad might be a standard that I pick. And then, you know, as we, as we played throughout time over the years, you know, we just started picking songs, talking about songs to play. Um, How much direction was there in the band? How much oral instruction? Was there any oral instruction in the band? No, no. The one thing, the one thing Roy did do, <laughs> um, I think this was like one of my, maybe my second gig, we were playing at the Iridium and, um, Roy said two things to us, to, to the band, well, one to me. Um, he, he yelled at me when, we were, when I got off the bandstand the first time. He said, man, don't you want to play? Don't you want to play? And I said, yeah, uh, you know. Uh, I play. <laughs> and he said, then why are you taking these short solos? Why are you taking these short solos? Come on, man, be in the moment. And I was shocked because, you know, I had been in the Mingus Bay for a long time, first of all. Mm. In Mingus Man, you don't take long solos. And, you know, I, from time to time, you know, I had tried to be respectful because I know that some band leaders don't like long solos. They, they don't want you to stretch. Mm -hmm. But Roy was like, look, man, if the moment takes you there, then let's go. Like, this is the moment right now. So when I think about, like, mm -hmm. uh, when I think about uh, uh, John Coltrane's band, you know, with like Elvin and and uh, McCoy and how they're stretching. And when I hear Roy with those bands or when I hear Bird, the apartment sessions, <laughs> you understand that it is absolutely about the moment. It's absolutely and it's absolutely about being with uh, being with band members or being with musicians that want to go there, that are willing to explore that, you know, that that that, that can play all night. You know, we would we would we would be in Japan, you know, I'll never forget. And, and Roy has done this at gigs, you know, after the gig, when people when everyone's gone, Roy will get back on the drum set, you know, and, and, and be playing, you know, mm -hmm. to some of the people that were still there. Um, and this is a man who was, you know, in his 80s. Yeah. You know, but in Japan, when I go to Japan, my first night, I'm completely done. You know, after the first set, I'm completely jet lagged. I'm half falling asleep on the stage. I got to go back to my room. And I'm like basically dragging myself out of the Blue Note in, Japan, in Tokyo after the first set, like the first time I went there with, with Roy. And I, I, I look on the stage and Roy is playing so hard at the end of the set, you know, midnight, jet lag, everyone else is jet lag. And I'm like, Roy is another from another planet, man. Mm. He's from another planet. And I really, I think it, it speaks a lot to the, his, his generation, you know, um, but just, and, and, and just the kind of, the kind of person that Roy is, he's just, he's just an amazing human being, but no, we never, we never, um, we never rehearsed and uh, touring, you know, touring with, 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 with Roy was, you know, it was great. It was great. It was fun. And it was just, it was just like, looking back, it's just amazing. I'm still amazed that, you know, 80 years old and we'd be walking through like, you know, uh, Frankfurt and and uh, I'm trying to think of what uh, um, I think it's Frankfurt uh, Airport, which is a huge airport. And Roy, Roy, Roy will be walking all the way through the airport, you know, 80, 85, 86 years old, you know, um, Nate Smith rehearsals are. Um, His like you know uh, all of the 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 the, uh, the other bands you know they they mostly send the music in advance, you know Roy does that, I mean I mean Nate does that and you know for me it's um, I really gotta check some of this stuff out and, and and practice it hard because you know they Nate deals with a lot of odd meters mm, yeah you know so um, 
some of the rehearsal for me is like figuring that out, you know, with 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 Nate, and also just blending. Um, and I think that goes that goes for all the rehearsals. Um, just really dealing with like, you know, um, playing with a vocalist. Nate's band has a vocalist. Um, Ama. Uh, yeah, Ama what? And she's you know she's a great vocalist, and I I you know I'm it's kind of like me and her, you know, playing things together. So I'm trying to blend with her, and complement her as much as possible and it's definitely like a band like art like hanging out with nate's band it's like it's like family like when we go out like when we land we all you know we, we all check into the hotel and it's like okay where we where are we going <laughs> you know where are we going for lunch in the morning we're texting each other where are we going for breakfast oh, you know that's great it's it, you know it's, it's like he calls the band kinfolk but we are we are like we're, we're really like family like we 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 really do hang and i think that's part of the the vibe of that band um uh tom harrell's rehearsals are um it's, it's the same thing I'm, I'm trying to think if if he sends us the music sometimes he sends us the music sometimes you just get the music at the re at, at the rehearsal you know but um tom's writing is just so very clear that our rehearsals go pretty they, they, they go through pretty clear like because everything is on the paper Mm. You know, except for, you know, except for where you're going to improvise, everything is there, you know, mm, wow. so I, I love this conversation about uh, about the hang, because this is a social music and I, it's such a big part of the history. Um, but now, I mean, you're you're especially now in covid, but I mean, you're also married now. Mm -hmm. And uh, but I mean, this doesn't just apply to you. I'm thinking. Do you. Can you think of any examples of people who are maybe like really introverted or for some reason or other, maybe they're married with kids, like they're not really in for the hang. Like, is there still room for uh, them on the scene? Like, how how do you manage that yourself now that you you have less time than you used to? Um, <laughs> this is going to sound funny, but I don't always want to hang <laughs> that much anymore, mm -hmm. you know uh it, it, it's funny because i'm so used to you know like we're here and we're watching you know at, at, at you know at at dinner we, we we watch a show and you know by the time 10 o'clock 11 o'clock rolls around i'm like thinking like how could i ever be out <laughs> how could i ever be out you know at a at a session or, or even at a gig like how is this going to work once this is over <laughs> you know mm -hmm. um I think that there's something to be said about hanging and going out. And I think that you know, just about everyone did it. You know, everyone has done it at some part of their life. Um, yeah. um, you, and, and most of them did it in their early 20s, you know, late teens. And um, I do think, I mean, you know, even if you think about the probably the most introverted musician, um, that musician probably hung out a lot too at some time you know that's how i really think the music is 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 is, is, is taught to some degree like from from hanging and, and being on the scene and being around your mentors or your 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 um your, your 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 heroes you know hearing and asking questions you know i tell my students all the time like go out like I, i'm sure i told you austin study with other people <laughs> you know yeah, i haven't taken they, you up on that much <laughs> oh man you have to and, and you know and the thing is now uh, now i really think that a lot of people will, will be more into giving lessons and yeah for sure i think now is the time to really take advantage of that too but even when this is over you know i think that's a huge part of what this music is about you know it's, it's like 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 you said that mentorship so I think it's it is about getting out, you know, like I did back in the day, um, you know, going to the zinc bar and meeting so many people um, and, and sitting in. It's, it's funny because I, I sat in so much uh, a couple of months ago, someone from NPR called me and said, hey, we have this recording of you playing with Tane that we're going to um, we're doing a, a series about Jeff Tane Watts and you're playing on it. And I said, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I said, uh, I never played in Tane's, Tane's band. And they said, no, you're sitting in. And I said, what? 
And it was literally, it was like at Lincoln Center. He was playing at Lincoln Center. I do not remember this, <laughs> but sure enough. And I, I asked him, I said, hey, can you guys send me the audio to this? Because I don't remember this. And they sent me the audio. And sure enough, Tane says, man, we're going to have uh, Jaleel Shaw come sit in on this tune. And I'm like, what? <laughs> so clearly, I went to Tane's gig with my saxophone. And at Lincoln Center, too. At Lincoln Center. <laughs> and he invited me up to, on the stage, you know. I do remember going to Tane's gig at the Zinc Bar and walking in the door. And you could see the door from the from the stage at this, this Zinc Bar. This is like the, the, the first Zinc Bar. Oh, wow. And as I was walking in the door, Tane saw me and he said, we're going to have Jalil come, come, come up and play, you know, on his song because they were in between songs. <laughs> and, and I'm like, OK, cool, you know. And he yeah. said, and we're going to have Kenny Garrett come up and play. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like at the door. Woo! I'm at the door and I'm like, oh, OK. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it was oh like, goodness. it was an amazing experience. You know, that, that was like the one time that I got to play with Kenny. It was at the Zinc Bar on on um, Houston Street. And we played one of the teen songs. I think it's called the, uh, the um, Impaler. Oh, you know. wow! Yeah. That's a that's yeah. a pretty tricky song, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, and it's and, and it's fast. But How it was did you great. know that song? Did you you didn't know the melody? Well, what 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 well, the thing about my relationship with Tane honestly is when I was at Berkeley, Berkeley, um, they had this drum um drum week, and they brought in, um, I think they brought in Terry Lynn Carrington, they brought in um, Tane. No, 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 no. Actually, I, I did something with Taylor and Carrington later. They brought in Tane for something else to do a concert, and they asked him to do something with the students. Oh. Or no, it, it, actually, I was the only student, and I think it was me and, 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 the, and the teachers. And he sent all of his music from his record that had just come out, which I had been listening to like crazy anyway, because it was Branford and Kenny and Winton on it, mm -hmm. you know. And it's an amazing record, but you know, we played those songs, so mm -hmm. I kind of knew those songs. Um, you know pretty well after that because I, you know, I was always playing playing along with that record. Yeah, yeah. man, Jaleel, we we actually have a, a commitment at six thirty, but okay. I mean, man, we I would love to do this as as long as you want, you know, another time. Um, but we usually end it with uh, like a ninety second fire round. Yeah, of just yeah. like not too serious questions, you know, uh, and then we'll. We'll have to wish a good night to a conversation okay. that I wish could could go on even further. Uh, yeah. Do you do you do you, do you have a timer? I don't. I don't have a timer on me. Let me. We can we can eyeball it too. Okay. <laughs> we'll eyeball it. All right. Three, two, one. All right. Favorite movie. Oh man. <laughs> Favorite movie. <sighs> I have to say maybe The Matrix now. All right. Uh, pineapple and pizza, yes or no? No. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite smoothie? Banana. From MSM. <laughs> huh? From Charwell's. <laughs> Charwell's? I don't know Charwell's, but I make smoothies, smoothies at home. So I have to say mango, strawberry, banana, maybe some kale. Mm. Very healthy. Yeah. <laughs> the best philly cheesesteak around i'm not a meat eater i'm a pescatarian so right. i would have to say sabrina's uh cafe uh vegan cheesesteak philly cheesesteak oh wow nice yeah favorite book or most recently read book i'm reading probably six books right now oh wow. <laughs> one of them i'm reading is called the the black 100 and it's uh it's like a a a, a, a list of um a hundred of the most important African Americans um, in that of in, in in history. Wow, yeah. Do you have a like a guilty pleasure pop singer? Um, no, but <laughs> no, I can't think of one now. No, no, who I like? No, who I think is pretty hip. I like. I think Bruno Bruno Mars is pretty hip. Yeah, mm. fair. <laughs> All right. Do you have any 
Hey, well, yeah, yeah uh, the last one. What was the last track you listened to? The last track I listened to was, um, I think, uh, I don't know, maybe from the new Kurt Rosenwinkel record. Oh, uh, yeah, the trio one? Yeah. With Dario yeah. on the electric. Vi- yeah. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. I love that record. Yeah. Love that. New, yeah. Kurt's new record. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Man, Jalil, uh, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, thank you, Jaleel. That was an awesome conversation. Beautiful stories. And um, yeah, we'll we'll talk soon. Definitely. All, All right. right. Thanks for having me. Great yeah, I'll send to it guys. to an outro, and uh, then we'll we'll be we'll be through. Okay. Sounds good. <laughs>